Hi everyone, I hope you're having a great start to your week. So this week I wanted to share with you some experimenting that I've been doing with the jelly plate and junk journals. And I have a couple different jelly plates that I am working with and I wanted to talk to you about the differences between the two. So one of them is from the actual Jelly Arts brand and that one is probably the one that most people are more familiar with. I also bought one by Speedball and the Speedball ones are actually more available like widely available in stores at least in my part of the country and I was able to find them at Michael's and I believe Joann's had them too. Sometimes they come as part of a block printing kit and the difference between the jelly plate and the speedball printing plate is that the speedball is made for block printing which is different you use different inks with it and you can still use some of the same types of applications that you would with the other jelly plates but I did find out a little bit too late after I bought the speedball plate that I wasn't going to be able to use acrylic paint on it which is what I'm used to using on jelly plates so that's just a word of advice if you're looking at jelly plates but does work on the speedball are which is a nice substitute for acrylics is temperas and these are actually a lot of times less expensive than acrylic paint even less expensive than craft acrylic paint and for instance I found these 16 ounce bottles at Hobby Lobby got several of them and they were each something like a dollar 20 I want to say on sale and even if they hadn't been on sale they would have been around two dollars a piece so I mean you get a ton of paint so really great investment and it'll be like one more tool in your arsenal if you want to have a different type of paint. And there isn't a ton of difference between the tempera and the acrylic. The only thing with tempera is it tends to be more transparent so if you want a more opaque look you would definitely want to layer. But otherwise it's super easy to work with and it's very similar to acrylics. So, for the first part of the video, I want to work on a 5x7 jelly plate that I got at Hobby Lobby. And this one is not the Speedball. This is the one that is more typically seen in your jelly printing videos. And it is compatible with acrylic paint. But what I want to use it for today is mainly with Distress Inks and Distress Oxides and stamping to start out. And then a little bit later in the video, you'll see me pull out the Speedball plate, which will which will be the um, rectangular one that is 8x10. You'll notice it right off because it's larger. It has a little bit of a reddish tint to it because it took on a reddish tint when I tried the acrylic paint and it has not come off. So <laughs> at least it's easy to spot. So right now I'm just going to grab that 5x7 plate and I will get going on that and see what we come up with. Okay. Okay, so I just want to show you the packaging. This is the gel press, and this is the one that I got at Hobby Lobby. And if you use your 40% off coupon, this is a really good deal. It was around $9. So it comes in the same type of clamshell packaging that you might already be familiar with if you already have a jelly plate. And it just comes between two sheets of plastic. And you always want to, sh to save the clamshell so that you can store your plate safely. And here's some instructions. So as you can see, this is a good size for a single page that would go in a junk journal. So I'm just going to peel away one side of the acetate here. And some alternatives, if you do not have a jelly plate or you're not interested in buying one, you can really use any type of non-stick surface to get similar effects. And if you watch any of Tim Holtz's videos, there's tons and tons of them out there where he's showing you how to make journal tags from paint or ink that is on his craft mat. It would be a really similar process to use a page that's going in your junk journal versus a tag. So a lot of the techniques that he demonstrates will apply the same way. And you could do that on something like this, a glass medium mat. You could do it on a silicone craft mat. Um, so there, there are tons of options really to get this mono printing 
type of effect. So what I'm going to first do is I'm going to take this 8.5 by 11 card stock that I would normally put in the junk journal, but I'm going to cut it down because I want to be able to size this exactly to my pages so that whatever is going to be on the edge of the gel press is going to go exactly on the edges of the paper so that there's no overlap of the paper. This is a little bit smaller of a size. I normally work with roughly 8x5, so this is going to be 7x5 paper because that fits the size of the gel press. So I'm just going to get my paper trimmer and trim that up very quick. So I've just trimmed down five sheets here, and once I fold them, they will exactly make 5x7 junk journal pages. And then, of course, you can always save these extra clippings, and they would make great belly bands. You can emboss these. You can do all kinds of stuff with these. So first off, one of the techniques I'm really interested in trying is going for a patina effect, and you'll see later in the video too that I try that with paint, but this time I'm going to try it with the oxides because there is a cracked pistachio color that I think would work really well as a patina. So what I'm going to first do is just spread out some vintage photo, this is going to be for majority of the paper and then the patina I want to try out on the edges. And don't worry if the ink doesn't look like very much on there, you're actually getting quite a bit on there and if you've worked with water reactive inks before you know that once you start to add water uh, it will definitely increase um, not only increase the amount of ink you can use because you're um, adding a lot of volume with the water, but um, you'll get some richer effects, especially with the oxides because they oxidize and turn different colors, which is cool. I'm just going to lay my paper down like that. And you can always use your hands or a brayer. I like using the rare. It's, um, it's a lot of fun for one thing, and also it's um, pretty concise. Okay, so there is our Distress Oxide and Vintage photo, and then I'm just going to add some water droplets and see what happens. And since it's oxide, I think we'll get some really cool patterns going on. Let me just set aside the jelly plate for a sec and I'm going to grab my heat tool. So here you can see where those droplets are, where it oxidized and it, it's a little bit of a lighter shade of brown. And then what I'm going to do next is I'm going to use the remainder of the ink on here to do another sheet. This actually came out really dark, so I'm hoping to get somewhere in the middle here or just like a lighter effect on this side. So let's see how we do there. Okay, so much, much lighter on that side. Actually, I think I'm going to go with a darker green to start and see how that does. This is peeled paint. And then I'll add the, cra the cracked pistachio on one of the pages, but I'm curious with the peeled paint just because it does look more vintage than the cracked pistachio. The, the pistachio is a much brighter green. Of course, whatever you do here is experimental. I mean, you can layer, and if you don't like what you're getting, you can always layer on top of it. I'm going to take the lighter side of the sheet and line that up as carefully as I can here. So I get all four edges. Ok, 
Okay, so that's kind of a cool effect. And then you can always add more water if you want. Get it to oxidize and move around a little bit more. And I don't know how well the jelly plate does with heat, so I'm just making sure to set it aside each time I'm drying because I don't want to melt it. So before I move on to paints, I want to go ahead and use the different ink that I'm going to be trying out. So this is a Versa Magic. This is their teardrop shape. Whoops, little um inkers and I'm just gonna go around the jelly plate those shades to see if I can get still a vintage looking print and I'm just gonna add some water too to help that get onto the paper and I'm using my really dark vintage photo page. So I wasn't able to line that up exactly perfectly, but I'll just get that top edge again. Okay, so it's very subtle but you can see a really light, almost ghostly green ink on there. And now I'm gonna try making a new sheet. And since the first time when we used the vintage photo, I had way too much ink on here, I'm just gonna lightly pat some of the ink on there and then saturate it a whole bunch with water and use the brayer to get rid of the square shapes. I'm thinking this will have more of like a droplet effect. And the cool thing is you never have to waste any paint or ink with the jelly plate. I mean, you can really just keep using it and keep sopping up with extra pages and just never have to let it go to waste. And even some of the paint now is coming up off of the brayer to give a little extra kind of grungy effect. And then you can always go back in and kind of play with a little bit. This side looks more like when you might have tea or coffee dyed. And then just for fun, I'm gonna try some fossilized amber just because it's a cool yellow color and I just want to see how it does on top of the vintage photo on top of cream paper. I think that might add something kind of interesting. Oh, pretty cool. I'll have to see what that looks like when it's dry. It might look a little different, but I'm just going to sop up some of the extra ink on the mat here. And then there's a color called Frayed Burlap, and Tim Holtz himself has said that this is one of his favorite distress colors because of the way the oxide version oxidizes he says um and i have worked with it and it does do some really cool stuff um it tends to have a little bit more variation once it oxidizes than a lot of the other colors and the other one i believe that has some really cool variations is seedless Perver preserves which i do not have but i saw on camera what he did with it and it was really cool so that's what it looks like wet, and then while the jelly plate is still wet, and I have a confession to make <laughs> about the jelly plate and uh, vintage paper in general. 
I really, okay, so the coffee dyeing process part of the junk journal for some reason to me is really tedious. And so any way that I can do something a little bit different and get similar results, I was willing to try. And coffee dyeing might be a little bit quicker than this because you can do a whole bunch of sheets at once and then you just need to wait for them to dry. Um, but, and I'm not ruling out coffee dyeing like permanently or anything, but um, I mean, this for instance took just a few seconds really, and I really like even just the way that stained right there. It looks like very watercolory, and um, so let me dry this frayed burlap and show you what Tim was talking about as far as the variation in color. I don't know if you can see it, but it kind of goes to almost a reddish, grayish brown, and then there are some lighter tones in there. And the more you layer, of course, the more variation you're going to get, but really cool effects on there. And we might as well just clean our media mat here with our paper and get some of that extra ink up. And then for the next part of this video, I'm going to be using the speedball plate and some of it will be narrated and some of it will just be sped up uh, experimenting with paint and you'll get to see some different cool vintage -y effects that I did with the 8x10 plate. As far as the size of the plate being 8x10, this is a good size to work with the junk journal because you can put your layouts um, in a rectangular way. Just gonna show you really quick. So let's say you have a set of papers that you've cut out that have your designs and or scrapbook paper or coffee dyed paper and it will just about perfectly fit on the jelly plate. So what I wanted to do was some experimenting in making these pages look more vintage using the plate. So what I'm going to do first is just apply a little bit of brown tempera paint. And like I mentioned before, this being the speedball plate and not one of the gel arts or jelly plates, it's a little bit different. It works a little bit differently than those do. Those are better with acrylics and this plate is better with block, printing ink, and tempura ink. I just put out a thin layer of the brown paint. I'm just going to smooth it over the jelly plate. And then I still have a little bit of paint on my brayer. I can see. Not very much of it is going down, but you could always brayer around the edges to get uh, like an aged effect around the sides. So it's pretty subtle, but you can see the difference that a little bit of that brown paint makes. Uh, another step I could do is to take some Distress Ink or Distress Oxide depending on what your preference is. And I'm just gonna put some down here on my glass mat and give it a little spritz of water. And then I'm going to use a brush. Actually, I'm gonna use this foam brush. If I completely clean off my plate again and, and make it free of paint, I could put the, the ink pad directly on there. I don't want to do that right now because there's still a little bit of paint on here. But I just am looking to see what type of effect I can get with a little bit of the tea dye distress ink. And now... I can go around these edges now that this has 
ink and paint on it. Just get a little bit more from the mat there. It's always nice when you can use up as much of your product as possible. So hopefully you can see that on camera that we have some nice tea dye staining around the edges. And then if you flip it over, you can see the tea dye along um, this side of the paper. So what I'm gonna do now, the best way to clean the speed ball plate is with nail polish remover. As for the jelly plate, if I remember correctly, it's actually better to use hand sanitizer or rubbing alcohol. For whatever reason, the way this one is formulated, it's best to use nail polish remover. I'm going to get that as clean as I can. And now I'm going to try putting the Distress Ink directly onto the mat and I'll try to vary it up a little bit as far as which direction I'm turning it so that the marks are not super obvious where the squares are. And then I'll go up high with my mister here and give it a few mists. And now I'm going to take another sheet. This one has some um, music printed on it, like a music sheet. And we'll see how this one does. So here's how that one came out, really cool. And even though you can still see some of the square imprints here, it still, I think, has a really neat effect. And it definitely looks more antique than it did before. So now what I'm gonna do is on this sheet and because I printed it on inkjet this is not going to be um, as waterproof as a laser print would be but that's okay And now I'm just spraying directly onto the paper with, this is Lindy Stamp Gang. There's still a little bit of the mica from the Lindy Stamp Gang uh, moon shadow mist, but I filled it with coffee grounds and water. And it's it makes a, a great little ink spray. Oh, I can really smell the coffee too. And I'm just gonna go around the edges once again with a little bit of what's now coffee ink. And I found with the inkjet prints, if you let them dry, like especially overnight, if you give them a good while to dry, they're a little bit more waterproof. They're not gonna be completely waterproof, but the ink won't run as much. And then I'm just going to get into these little edges that you can see that are still white. And it is going to warp the paper a little bit, but that just sort of adds to the aged effect. 